Carr, the physicist and researcher. For nearly 30 years, he led the component technology branch of the Air Force Research Laboratory, formerly known as AF Cambridge Research Laboratory, Room Laboratory, Metro, Massachusetts, where his basic research on surface acoustic waves resulted in signal processing filters used in radar, communication, cell phones, and TV. Today, he's exploring the question of faith and green technologies save us in time. Thank you. Uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be describing my background a little toward the end of the talk. I have the references. Actually, my first environmental paper was uh, Sacramental Water, Water and the Challenge of Global Warming, and I presented at Boston University at a uh, Science and Religion Symposium there. But today, my topic is Will Faith in Green Technologies Save Us in Time? Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Gospel of James, and um, I'll be describing some of the things that we can do, uh, the action we can take at the end of my talk. Faith in new technologies is needed for scaling the economic viability of the mountain. And uh, Bill Gates did that successfully, and I'll be talking about his, uh, he's been doing it, uh, toward the middle of my talk. So the challenge these days, what we've been observing recently, and particularly this year, uh, climate change extremes. Dry areas, dry areas are getting drier, and wet areas are getting wetter. Dry, dry areas are wider, are drier because there are more droughts, wildfires uh, from the higher evaporation rates, and uh, we've seen that this summer. I'm going to be highlighting that uh, in a few moments. Uh, but wet areas are getting wetter, floods, hurricanes, because atmosphere holds more water at higher temperatures. So this is a, uh, a slide that was provided me by uh, Tim Wallace, who's here, uh, who has a uh, solar panels on his roof, and he uh, pointed and he said, uh, this explains the smoke that we had here cutting down on my solar panels performance. You can see the, uh, <laughs> you can see the fires, the fires in, in Western Canada. Uh, it was a very strange configuration of the atmosphere, which funneled the soap, uh, this uh, smoke uh, under his solar arrays in Bedford, Massachusetts. It wasn't particularly dramatic then, uh, but what was really, uh, what really has been, had been more dramatic has been the, the wildfires up in, uh, uh, north of us, up in uh, Quebec, and the uh, jet stream, uh, prevailing winds, have brought the, the, that smoke down, that smoke down to uh, New York City and uh, southern Pennsylvania, as I'll show you. Um, Headline uh, New York Times back in uh, uh, June 7th. Wildfire smoke. Millions in North America face hazardous air quality driven by fires in Canada. You can all see many days people in uh, New York City had to stay inside and, and uh, very difficulty uh, breathing, as you can see. And I have relatives down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, same sort of thing at, at a later time. Hopefully this, this gets the attention of people that uh, uh, maybe we better do something about global warming. Here's the data, here's some recent data, uh, or data going back to the 1980s. Uh, the areas burned back in the 1980s was around uh, 5 million acres, as shown here, uh, and then uh, it's gradually picked up, and in more recent years, it's uh, almost doubled to about 10 million acres per year. And I'm sure when the, this year's data comes in, we may actually probably have a new peak. But uh, the areas that wildfires burned has doubled since 1980. You know, of course, this is climate data um, because, uh, of course, a, a single year is not climate. Climate is long-term trend, and, and the long-term trend, I think, is, is very clear. Well, you're probably familiar with this book uh, by Catherine Hayhoe. She spoke at our... Uh, our uh, ASA symposium in uh, Golden, Colorado in 2017, a very impressive talk. That's why I bought this book, book Saving Us in Climate Science, Peace, for Hope, and Healing. Her main theme for this title is our planet Earth will survive, but not necessarily present civilization as we know it. 
percentage of people who are seriously concerned about climate change has been increasing. She did cite this uh, this poll in her book. Uh, there are people uh, on the extreme uh, uh, who say, oh, and it's a hoax. Uh, but the people who are seriously concerned has gone up some, some, somewhat at, at the point of the survey. Every, everything else, everybody else is pretty much the same, but the, 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 sometimes you've got some good news that the percentage of people who are seriously concerned are, has been increasing. Well, let's talk about uh, Bill Gates, his uh, next generation solar nuclear reactor to be built, built, actually being built now in Wyoming. Of course, Bill Gates had faith in the emergent personal computer technology. We all know about the success of, of, of uh, Microsoft. But now he's putting his faith into action in terms of next generation nuclear reactors for generating carbon-free electricity. This is a, a, a summary or schematic of, of what he's doing. Uh, presently, and there are a lot of uh, coal-fired electric, electric generation, electric generating plants in, in Wyoming and, and also the rest of the country, but you can see coal generation is characterized, of course, by uh, carbon dioxide and smoke emissions, but the purpose of the, uh, of the coal burning is to produce steam, and the steam uh, uh, to, uh, turns the veins of a turbine, which generates electricity. And Bill Gates is in the process of replacing this coal-fired plant by a nuclear, small, modular uh, nuclear reactor, which also produces steam, as you can see, and that, that steam from the nuclear plant will now be, uh, uh, when he's done, will, will, will be powered, uh, cause the turbine uh, wheels to turn, and of course this is green energy as opposed to the uh, accruing uh, uh, carbon dioxide and smoke from, uh, from, from a coal plant. And uh, these small nuclear reactors, by the way, use heat uh, generated by the reactor at the bottom of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, of this uh, vertical uh, 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 reactor here. So, uh, so the steam produces water. Uh, it's a water cool reactor. So the water boils and in, in this reactor and produces steam. There. That's how nuclear reactors work. So. Um, well, the overall theme what we'd like to see happen is ecology trumping economics. In actuality, I think it's, it's unfortunately the other way around. Economic trumps ecology. But uh, just a summary of uh, what I've been telling you, non-carbon emitting electricity 24-7. Now, wind and solar uh, are, are green. They don't emit carbon dioxide, but on the average, uh, they're only there 33% of the time. Bill Gates' breakthrough technologies include small modular fission reactors exp uh, ex expediting the coal to nuclear revolution. <laughs> and we, we expect uh, uh, these small modular reactors will be uh, available and, and online and working uh, toward the end of the decade. And Gates and others are investing 1.8 billion in fusion reactors under development uh, particularly all over the country, but it particularly, common, particularly Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which was a MIT spinoff um, in, in the Cambridge area, and, and they're, going to, they're in the process of demonstrating the potential for generating green energy by 2030 via fission reactors. Uh, and, and fission reactors have the advantage that there's no radioactive waste. That's their big advantage. I might mention that uh, the uh, particular breakthrough with, uh, that Commonwealth Fusion uh, Systems is exploiting. They're using the latest generation of uh, superconducting magnets. And this enables the, uh, the, the size of the magnets to be much smaller than, for example, the uh, Inter International Thermoelectric Nuclear Reactor in southern France. And, and that's why it's expected to, uh, to generate and uh, demonstrate the viability of, of fusion generated electricity by 2030 before uh, um, the uh, one in, in southern France. Uh, and uh, basically, the high temperature uh, 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 magnets have produced the world's largest magnetic fields, about 21 Teslas. Uh, I, I used to use uh, electromagnets in my research, and we were. In, we were, we, were, we, were, we were dealing with much smaller electric fields than I got with us. 
a, a, con a conventional uh, electromagnet. Uh, or new technologies like deep, deep geothermal and green hydrogen will cause carbon concentrations to level off. But it will be centuries that uh, the carbon dioxide half-life before they decrease. And I'm going to argue for the advantage that carbon capture is immediate. Will carbon capture and utilization become more economical? Well, this is the um, where we're at now. Uh, this is the carbon dioxide emissions. Of pre we're presently about 420 parts per million. Is that's the, that's the, and of course they're increasing. So let's look forward to the uh, to the future. Uh, um, China, for example, has said that their their uh, carbon dioxide emissions will peak and start decreasing, level off, and go down uh, by uh, right around 200, the, the year 2060. Uh, of course, right now, uh, China is the world's largest uh, carbon dioxide emitter. But uh, does anyone know which country, on a per person basis, which country has the largest carbon dioxide emissions per capita? Yeah, that's good. No, well, I don't know about Canada. I don't have data for Canada. <laughs> it could be, that, but I know it's the United States. The, the data that I have is the United States. Canada, I, I really don't know what it is for Canada. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, the, there are, there are uh, conservatives who say, uh, well, you know, uh, why should we cut back on our carbon dioxide emissions because China is the world biggest emitter and, and, and well, well, you know, why should we care? Well, at least we are, we are more responsible in the sense that our emissions per person are about twice that of, of China. So from that point of view, I think it makes us more responsible. But anyway, I'm arguing that if we capture and sequester the CO2 concentrations would decrease uh, in different proportions of the rule. Here we are uh, in 2060, okay. Um, uh, uh, the world emissions will be going down, but you can see what's happening is the carbon dioxide emission, it's still going up at a slower rate. And this is a result of the fact that carbon dioxide half-life, due to natural absorption like the ocean and, and soil and so forth, takes, uh, you know, the half-life is the order of a century. So we're not going to see any benefit uh, from uh, uh, the solar panel that you just saw. Uh, but if we can pull that carbon out of the atmosphere, it's the needed and proportion to the rate at which you move it. So, um, Mark Schott, uh, who's senior director of uh, carbon capture at Honeywell, says uh, we can capture CO2 economically. The big pro and CO2 capture from the smokestack is the most economical uh, because it's more dense there, but there's also direct air capture, which is more difficult because the carbon dioxide emissions are, are uh, and intensity is lower. But the big problem is what what can we do with the captured CO2? Any any suggestions, by the way, what to do with it? Go forest. Right? Well, the for, you know, forest, uh, 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 that's right, forest do that forest, it's a plant more tree, that's certainly, that's, um, that's certainly, uh, uh, certainly a solution, yeah. How about limestone bricks? Right, that, well that's, yes, that's another, that's another way of capturing and uh, tying it up as a, as a chemical compound. And that, and that, that I think, is a, is a key, uh, key, key uh, chemical reaction. And as a matter of fact, here's a, um, here's a, um, Example of a UK startup uh, which is using the absorbed carbon dioxide in a, in a tied up in a chemical compound, maybe like calcium carbonate or limestone, and they're using it to make drywall. And of course, drywall is something you can sell, so it makes it uh, uh, economically viable. So, carbon capture and utilization. Uh, for a sellable product. That, that's, what, that's what we need. We need more of that at a larger scale. Um, here's an example, though, of uh, carbon capture and utilization, uh, CCU, at a coal plant in, uh, in Texas. Essentially, this plant in Thompson, Texas, was the only U.S. power plant to successfully capture carbon dioxide from post-combustion and and to a post combustion at a commercial scale. The CO2 was, was compressed and piped into an oil field for enhanced oil recovery. The system 
operated from 2017 to 20. With, however, when low oil prices made capture uneconomical, there's a case of economics trumping uh, ecology. And it, they were all set up uh, and, and, and selling the carbon dioxide to the uh, oil producers, but uh, um, it became economical when the price of uh, when, the, when, the, when the price of oil uh, 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 well, just said when the price of a capture on that kind of angle, that's the state. But you can see here's, here's a coal plant with a you know with a uh, emitting a particle um, of carbon dioxide and also uh, smoke <clears> with uh, lots of particles in it. So let me just read this to you. This is an article that I just was just published in uh, in uh, Physics Today. Capture alone isn't sufficient to bottle up carbon dioxide. U.S. is has practically boundless capacity to store carbon dioxide. It just needs to find a way to do it. Combined uh, billions of dollars with federal tax su subsidies combined with enhanced tax credits have stimulated dozens of new carbon capture and storage and direct air capture project in the U.S. But a severe bottleneck in the regulatory process for transport and storage is slowing progress toward meeting the goal of the Biden administration to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The 2021 Biopartisan Infrastructure Investment and Job Act appropriated more than $10 billion in R&D and demonstration project funding for five years for carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. And at least a year's Inflation reduction at, at last year's Inflation Reduction Act provided a powerful incentive to projects that lock up carbon dioxide, raising the carbon credit for capture and permanent storage of CO2 to $85 per ton from its per previous level of $50. The credit was an, an elevate, an elevated, elevated from 19 to 35 $50 per ton if the CO2 is utilized for coal production and other applications, such as incorporating it into concrete and building material. That's another example of incorporating. I, I gave the example of, of, of uh, using the captured carbon dioxide in, 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 for wall horn, and another application is, is to use it to, to cap it to uh, basically sequester it in concrete, which is obviously a marketable, uh, marketable product. So that's the uh, that's that, that this is the uh, this is this is the technology that I think we need to, to really emphasize, and you can see it's getting a boost from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, this Inflation Reduction Act. Well, what can people of faith do now? There's a book out called Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to propose to reverse global warming, edited, edited by Paul Hawkins. And uh, of the 100 ways of reducing global warming, the following were rated as shown. A plant-rich diet, reduce food waste, distributed photovoltaics come in eight, uh, you just saw that uh, in, in the previous talk, uh, and uh, electric cars, which uh, I, I, I got bought one in 2017, and it's a fun way to save our planet. I, I was a little disappointed that it was only rated at, uh, at 41. I know. Uh, uh, Tim Wallace uh, just bought one for his wife. Uh, it's, it's a fun way to fun way to learn uh, fun way to uh, to to save our planet. Uh, this is a uh, some data I took from Drawdown. This is the actual chart. Uh, solutions uh, which you can find, uh, easy go to Drawdown.org. Solutions table of solutions. And here they're ranked according to the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that you save by the technology. You can see. Utility scale of photovoltaics is second on, on the list, uh, whereas, uh, and as I told you, uh, three on the list is a plant-rich diet. Now, the, the, uh, the argument is um, food, <coughs> it cuts down mainly on the uh, methane emissions, which is a more potent uh, greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide, which we get from, uh, from uh, livestock. It comes out both ends from the manure and uh, from that digestive systems. So, uh, so that's why it's ranked number three, um, and also reduce food waste. Food waste. So this is something that we can uh, we can all 
start doing immediately, probably after tonight's uh, 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 <laughs> barbecue. After you've enjoyed, hopefully this will be your last beef. Because by the way, beef is, is the word, is, is beef, the equivalent carbon dioxide of beef production is the highest. You're much better off if you eat if you do, if you eat chicken, and that's what we've been doing. And of course, chicken is better for your, uh, better for your heart, lower cholesterol. So, uh, plant-rich diet, and and chicken is much better than than beef. Uh, uh, you notice um, also, uh, I thought clean cooking is on the. Well, I'll just I'll just show you here. This is the distributed photovoltaics that you heard about. Uh, you can see the clock. Uh, it's rated at 64 carbon equivalent. Here, let me just show you. Yeah. Car distributed photovoltaics, which is rooftop solar, as you can see, rated at 64, whereas if you go to the, uh, the utility scale of voltaics, it's about twice that. And that's a good the economy of scale. I mean, that you could have whole fields of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, utility scale utilities. And of course, uh, you know, there, there's, there's more labor involved in putting those panels on your roof and tying it into your, your, uh, your, your electric box. So, um, Let's, uh, okay, in, in, uh, to wind up here, well, faith in green technology save us in time. We must act quickly before our Earth reaches a runaway tipping point where humans, like my great mitigation, will have little effect. CO2 is a half-life of a century. Carbon capture and utilization has an immediate impact, it should be emphasized. The benefits of reducing CO2 emissions will not be evident for, uh, evident for well for all the things that we're doing today. I mean, the money we're spending, and we, we won't see any benefits for in, in terms of uh, reduced uh, uh, weather extremes for over a century. So it's going to take faith to believe that climate science, uh, climate science is telling that in about a century, CO two emissions from natural. Uh, CO2 reduction from, from natural processes is going to take over a century. Whereas if you pull it out of the atmosphere, we get an immediate benefit. So uh, uh, immediately after a Canadian barbecue, we should eat a more <laughs> vegetarian diet and, and reduce the greenhouse emissions for agriculture and, and animals. So, so maybe not, maybe this will probably be my last chance to not eat some I have those babies or cribs or whatever. Uh, but after that, let, let's stick to the chicken uh, and, and white meat. Okay, let down. Okay. Um, so let me just. Uh, just, just some references to earlier talk. My first talk uh, on, on uh, some references. Uh, well, okay. Well, this is one that I gave in 2018. When what is climate change doing for us? To us and for us. This is my most complete paper published in Zygon Journal of Religion and Science. And my most recent uh, reference was I mentioned uh, David Craver's carbon capture article in Physics Today, which I, I showed you the title page of that. Um, and uh, this is a book that I just published recently, um, Loves in My Life, uh, and How I Became Interested in Science and Religion, and more recently in Climate Change. So thank you. I thank you so much for your talk and your work and your ongoing uh, advocacy. I wonder if you would comment on how much work is being done to restore oxygen to the atmosphere. We talk a lot about carbon dioxide, and uh, we talk about storage of carbon dioxide, but we're not talking about the release of oxygen back into the atmosphere and around the Earth. So would you mention some work that's going on in that realm? Yeah, I think you're making a very important point. You know, all the curves show carbon dioxide going up, but they're also curves showing that the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere is going down, uh, which is vital for life as we know it. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, planting more trees is about the only thing I can think of right hand. There are, there are articles showing that um, uh, planting more trees will have a big effect, but unfortunately we're doing just the opposite. These, these um, wildfires are doing just the opposite. They're, they're cutting down the number of the, the forest and also, um, uh, also uh, the Amazon is being cut down for, for economic reasons. And I understand there are, I know the Environmental Defense Fund is trying to uh, offer 
I think we basically have to offer economic subsidies to some of these developing countries, not to cut down their, their jungle because uh, it's negatively impacting. And, and as they say, the trees are great because they, they basically take carbon dioxide out of the air, convert it into oxygen, and store their carbon as wood. Um, thank you for your talk. I really have heard the promising tax solutions to help with the climate crisis. Um, but I guess I was wondering, thinking more broadly, um, it seems that CO2 emissions are just a piece of a larger problem that we have of overconsumption um, in our global society. And so I guess I'm wondering uh, whether we should also be thinking about reframing the economic system itself um, so that we're not worried about what's economical, but rather uh, what's ecological and what we can plan collectively to meet our needs and all of these. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, there there are. I know there. I don't know. There's a first, there is is a person that we need to change our our whole economic system and make it more ecological. Um, it is interesting that all the economists say and I, um, that a carbon tax or a carbon fee is a, is the most economical way um, of, of, of of bringing carbon dioxide emissions down. Um, I know the, uh, the, the there's a uh, uh, organization uh, uh, that, that's uh, Citizens Climate Law Lobby has been advocating a proposal by a former Treasury Secretary Charles Schultz, uh, which is basically we, we put a fee on carbon. We, 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 uh, once you put a fee on carbon, then the cost of gas, and I understand that's happening in Canada right now. Canada people are nodding their heads. Canada does have a carbon, a carbon, actually a carbon tax, but our, our um, uh, uh, but our legislature in our in, in Washington D.C. Uh, has not been able. I know we had a, a carbon cap and trade bill was came out of the House of Representatives in about it was 09, but the Senate never acted on it. And you notice this latest bill is does not have any carbon fee, but it gives a a uh, uh, a tax rewards or tax incentives. For, for for green technology, in other words, if we just heard that former talk that uh, that uh, if you put in solar panels on your roof, you get uh, government rebates uh, on your on your taxes, and and then similarly, if you put in a heat pump or so forth, there's, there's government subsidies now, uh, which uh, will reduce the cost of green technology. So in a sense, in the United States, we're reducing the cost of we're giving you tax incentives, but. But, but the idea of the more more economical way is, is just simply to put a, uh, I might mention that Schultz's proposal was to, uh, okay, we're gonna, if we, 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 if we put a fee on carbon, there'll be a lot of money generated. And what's gonna happen to that money? Well, his proposal was to give it back to everybody to pay for their high, high energy bill. And other, the average person is gonna, with a carbon, with a carbon fee on, on gasoline, it's going to cost a lot more to drive your automobile to get to work. Well, this, this Schultz's idea was okay. A family of four out of but that money that that, that that you know that that the carbon producers are paid is going to be distributed to everybody. So the average family of four would get maybe two thousand a year uh, of, of a of a, uh, of a government subsidy to pay for their. Uh, higher gasoline and for their higher electricity costs. Right now, most electricity is generated with natural gas, which emits carbon. So uh, the cost of, of, of fossil fuels for the customer would go up, but they'd have more money to pay for it. But at the same time, non-carbon emitting uh, sources like wind, solar, nuclear, uh, would, would have a big uh, advantage at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, economically. Yeah. Yes. Last question here. Yeah, I'm noticing more and more students uh, are talking about having no children anymore, and that's the responsible thing to do. And I'm wondering, from a Christian perspective, like, is it time to stop being fruitful and multiplying, or is it more about <laughs> having children that are walking more lightly on the earth? I mean, like, this is an honest discussion among many young people. Uh, and, and what is a Christian sort of perspective of how to responsibly navigate all of that? That, that, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, actually, I was interested. The, the summary of sustainability was enough for everyone. For 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 no enough for, for everybody. And I said to myself, well, if there are fewer everybody's, <laughs> if there are fewer everybody. The, the need for 
for uh, you know food and whatever is going to go down. I mean, just if there were fewer people, they would obviously. If there were fewer people using eating or, or burning gas, they're obviously going to be you know there's going to be less uh, less carbon dioxide emitted. So that is a uh, that that is. A, but on the other hand, and as you 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 probably read in the news that car, uh, China had a no a no child policy. And their their population is, is going down, but their sacrifices involved with that. People our age that are on Social Security, they're going to be more retired people getting Social Security, and there won't be enough young people to pay to, to support us. And that that is a that is a that is a problem when you, when you have a, when you have more old people who can't work and need government support. Uh, where are the young people? You know, where are the young people that are going to working people that have been putting money into social security? <laughs> so that, that that that's a that's a not, it, 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 There are problems each way, every way, but but, but long term. Well, actually, you know, if you just look at uh, the dem the demographics of Europe, uh, South Korea, populations are going down. In other words, in other words. Uh, for a sustainable population, it's 2.1 births per woman, and it's it's significantly lower than that in Europe, in in Russia, uh, and even the United States. It would be true, and the only way we keep our population up is by immigration. So, civilized countries are already doing it, uh, and and it's the it's the third world where uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and and of course these. These, these, these countries that are dependent on family farms, their social security is having children. In other words, when, if you don't have a government social security and you own a farm, when you're, too, when you're not able to work, if you have a lot of kids, they will run your farm and, and feed you. So uh, that's one of the reasons why third world countries still have, uh, are, are, are having a lot of kids because that's their social security. Well, thank you, Paul. Let's thank all of our speakers.